So there's this um, famous painting that all of us have seen. Uh, We probably all know about it. It's a painting of Jesus. Jesus is there at the middle of the table, and then on each of his sides are all the disciples, and they're eating, right? We all know this called the Last Supper. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci, he painted this painting, and maybe you recognize it. We have it right here. Um, uh, This would be what you maybe have seen before. Here's Jesus. Here's all the others that he's done ministry with beside him, And, and many people over the course of years have discussed this painting. They've talked about this painting, and, and uh, they, they've discussed the different parts. Like, well, each disciple, what they're doing, it looks like there's uh, maybe Mary Magdalene is there. Like, all this is happening. They're, they're going like, man, where's Judas? Like, and they all even start to look at each of the disciples and say, man, he, he was so accurate with how he painted to try to depict a portion of the disciples' actions in the scriptures. And this is all discussed and people debate and they, they find more intricacy, right? That's what we do with paintings. We stare at them. You, you do this thing because you're not sure what to do, so, but you want to look like you're artistic. So you're like, hmm, but you have no idea what you're talking about. And you, you're looking at this painting and, and people discuss it all the time. But then something else happened. Uh, another person, he's an Italian musician. He was looking at the painting. He started to notice something different about this painting. He started looking, and, and he started noticing the table kind of has this line across it, right, like a normal table would. And he started to look at the different levels, and he started noticing the bread loaves and where they're located, and then the hands of each of the, the disciples and where they're located. And, and for some reason, he, he brought what he was educated in, his musician, and he brought it to this portrait, and he began to draw different things out. And he discovered something in this painting that no one yet discovered. He discovered it looks as if... This this is a sheet of music that is here in this spot. So then he, he, he draws it out, and we have that right here as well, what it would look like. And uh, each hand, each bread loaf creates what we would call like sheet music, a, a, a different song. And, and then he began to see what does this song make up, and, and it made up a song, and it made up a song that would last 40 seconds. Now, scholars, researchers, they all come, and they want to really check this out, debate it. Is this accurate or not? And, and they've all had to conclude that there is no way that this could happen by accident, and it would make a song that would actually sound good for 40 seconds. Like, there's no off note or anything. It, it, it all lined up. So everyone concluded that Leonardo da Vinci, he had a hidden message in this painting. There was something beneath the main thing. For all of us, we, we live our lives with, like, a, a thing beneath the thing. Like, you live your life always going and always trying to figure out things. But that thing beneath the thing, we, we usually call it, like, happiness. We're all searching for it. We all want it. Like everything we do is with regard to our own happiness. And, and I don't mean that in a bad thing. That's a normal, like natural thing. It's not wrong in and of itself um, to, to discover and seek happiness. The, the problem often is where we're looking. So we, we look at happiness all the time. You, the, the clothes that you wear, the car that you drive, the person you married, you thought they were going to make you happy. Um, they do. You got to work at it. Uh, like everything, right? Like even even what attracts us to someone else. Uh, like all this stuff is our own pursuit in some sense of happiness. And it's not wrong, and it's kind of normal, and it's not really new news in any way. This is kind of just normal. What's what's not is where we're looking for happiness. Because often we're looking in the wrong places, and we're actually not discovering happiness, but we're actually hurting ourselves. This is the conversation that I I, I hope to have over the course of these next weeks. That we look at this, there's this famous quote, James Houston, he says it this way, he says, happiness doesn't fall into our laps by chance or accident. It's intentionality, it's required. Like this last week, my my wife and I, we went out of town, Uh, it was her birthday, we went to go celebrate And uh, my wife, she stressed out, she prepped, she had the house in order. Everything is ready. The kids will be good. We're okay to go. And when we returned, what we discovered was it was not left how she left it. Right? You all know what I'm talking about. Our oldest son thought it was a cool idea to give our youngest son a haircut. So the front looked more like maybe a bowl cut, and the back was an intention of a mullet. So our littlest son is walking around with like a bowl cut in the front and a mullet in the back. 
It, it was not a good look. Like, like that, but that's normal. Like, if you just look at life, that is normal. Like, like everything has to be intentional if you want to experience, like, order. Because uh, if not, just if you allow things to happen how they happen, it will naturally lead to chaos. Like, we have to be intentional about this. So when we talk about nine keys to happiness, this is the conversation. What we're going to unpack is what's known as the fruits of the Spirit. And we're going to look in Galatians. But, but what we want to look at is it's, it's not some accident or anything. We have to be intentional with God's word to say, man, God has revealed to us. There is a message before us. It's a, not a hidden message, but we've hid it in our own selves. We have read through it and just blown through it and continued our day, but it's right there. God reveals it for us that we would discover, hey, you want to experience fulfillment? You want purpose in your life? You want happiness? Like, you don't want that to just fade, whether you have that thing or you don't have that thing or those people like you or they don't like you, but you want to experience it at all times throughout your life? It's right here. And over the next days, over the next weeks, we're going to unpack this and we're going to look at it. So would you join me? Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. Chapter 5, verse 22. We're going to read this. It says this, it says, starting in verse 22, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Like those, those all sound really nice, but probably for most of us when we read those, we say, I don't got many of those in my life at all times. Maybe a moment in the day, but not every day. And it says this, it says the Holy Spirit produces this. This is what the Holy Spirit does. And maybe the first thing that we would discover is um, it's not about what you can do, but it's about what the Spirit does. Like w when we look at these, for me, most of my life, I looked at the fruits of the Spirit as uh, actions that I'm supposed to do. Like I'm supposed to just be this. So I have to be like loving. I have to be joyful. I have to be patient, try to skip that one. I have to be peaceful, like I have to do these things. And when I don't, I'm not doing it right. So I just have to continue to work at it and maybe I'll finally get to it. And we live a lot, like you have to produce this. But if you read the first words of that verse, it says, this is what the Holy Spirit produces in your life. Not what you produce, like maybe the best thing that you could hear today is it's not for you to just be this. You can't be it on your own. But it's actually that the spirit of God works in this. See, happiness is the fruit of a particular way of life. And it's not the way of your life, but it's the way of the spirit at work in your life. It's the spirit's work. This is what the spirit produces. It's not about what you can accomplish for many of us, maybe we just need to look at this. Like, I, growing up, like it used to be like that. They had a picture of different, like a bowl of fruit, and uh, they would like name the banana like patience or something. It was not a good look um, at the time, but but this idea of like this is what the spirit produces. The spirit produces these things in your life. For us, maybe it just starts first with like, what do you do with fruit, or what should you do? You should eat it. For many of us, we're trying to figure out how to like make it and like grow it. And maybe like in this text, it's not about you going and growing it. It's about you like participate in it. Like actually take this in. This is the work of the spirit, not of you. And maybe if we first start with that, then we begin to discover where we build on. See, we don't manufacture it. You can't just manufacture patience. Like first you need to see that God was patient with you. Like th that's, that's where it starts. That's where we have to discover it. For many of us, we've had this wrong the whole time. And maybe the best way to look at it is you are your father's son or your mother's daughter. What I mean is often you begin to look, act, speak the way your parents did. 
For some of you, you're like, no, I'm nothing like them. But certain parts, you still have a little of what they were like. Sometimes it's the bad things. Sometimes it's addictions that you have to be careful of. Sometimes it's the way that your family treated each other in marriage is the way sometimes you speak or act in your marriage. And sometimes you need to be mindful of that. Sometimes it's how you respond quickly to your kids because that's how your parents responded quickly to you. Often we are who our parents were to some level or another. And maybe the best thing we could do when we talk about the work of the Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit in our life, are first to see who the Father is. If, if we look at this, the, see the Father is a Father of love. God is, is joyous. God is a peaceful God. God has been more patient with you and with me than we deserve, but he continues to be patient. See, God is a God that is kind. God is a good God, no matter your circumstances. God is faithful, always. God is gentle. Like Maybe when we start to see this is who God is, then we begin to say, this is how I can live in that, and not how do I produce it or manufacture it on my own. Like may, maybe it first starts in this way. And when we, when we discuss this, like often we want to get to like, okay, cool. So God is those things. Like now, what does that mean like in my life? Because I, I get told like every day I'm not patient enough. So like at some point, maybe I should probably like look at that and go like, I think I need to be more patient. So how does that live out in my life? First, we still have to discuss like what does this look like? What does it mean? What does it, what does it mean to be good? What does it mean to, to experience good? What is good? Like, cause we, we can all just have our own definitions of good. Like when I was, when I was a kid, I, I, I grew up in the nineties. Um, I, I, I liked music and I was, I was shown music by my older brother cause he was older so he could like uh, get more music before I was old enough to like discover this stuff. And I uh, and man, all of a sudden I start hearing bands like Nirvana or Pearl Jam. Like, right, you start hearing Rage Against the Machine, like, what? Like, you, you start hearing all this music, and you're like, wow, this is good stuff. And then the years pass, and you start to, to take on the new music that's coming out. So all of a sudden, you start hearing this new stuff. You start hearing, like, Oasis in that time as well, like Wonderwall. Yeah, I want to be British. Like, you start hearing all this good stuff. 311, my friend and I, we went to their concert. Like, it was awesome. Like, I, they sing weird, but it's good music. Like, you, you start hearing all this music, and then you get older, and then you, you start noticing the next music that's coming out. For my generation, it was like Taking Back Sunday and Berlin, The Used. Like, then you start getting a little further, and now you start hearing some other music where now older people, you're like, why do you guys listen to that? Like, and where they start screaming in the song also, and it's like, yeah, I'm angry about I don't know what. My mom told me to clean my dishes. Like, whatever. Like, all that was all the music that I grew up with. But then you start to discover all that stuff came from stuff before it. So you start going back in time and you start noticing other bands. Bon Jovi, Journey, ACDC. Like, all these bands, you're like, whoa. Like, that's where they came from. And they only built on those things. And like, you're like, you start to like respect and you start to go, man, this stuff is good. Like you start recognizing other things that are good. And, and then I met my wife and, and I'm like, oh, you got to check out the music that I grew up listening to. This stuff's good. And some of it, she's like, yeah, that's pretty good. And other stuff, she's like, why is he screaming so much? Chill out. Like, and then she shows me some of her stuff and some of it I know, like TLC. You all know what I'm talking about. Like a river or a waterfall or something was love. I don't remember exactly. Like, uh, Shakira, but the older stuff, like my wife loved that. And I was like, yeah, that's pretty good. And then all of a sudden she, she introduces me to like Selena and like bitty bitty bomb bomb. And I'm like, okay, I didn't grow up with it, but I, I respect it. But the thing is like, there's stuff that like I'll say is good that my wife sometimes is like, I like good for you, buddy. Good for you. Where maybe, maybe she doesn't see the same good in it. And we do this with all of our lives, like in every aspect, food. Many of us, you have certain food that you love and other food that you never want to touch. Some of you have never experienced just raw fish. It's delicious. Like all of us have different things. I like, like honestly, I'm pretty open to all food except for black olives. I don't know why God created those. Green olives, good. Black olives, my daughter and my wife even will put them on their fingers and eat them in front of me. And I'm like, that's disrespect. And that needs to be dealt with. Like, 
Like, but all of us, we have different opinions on even food. We, we have different opinions on many different things. Uh, we, uh, tattoos, some of us like tattoos, some of us don't like tattoos at all, but then some of us also look at tattoos and we're like, I like a certain style of tattoo. So what is a good, like we, we do this with everything, with people. We do this with all of our lives, we just look at, we all have different even definitions or opinions about what is good. We do this even with God's word. All of us, we probably have heard of the verse John three sixteen. Hey, you might be able to say it, by heart right now. Maybe you're like, I don't remember, but I, 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 I've heard of it before. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, blah, blah. Like, all, like all of us might be like, yep, that's the one. I know that one. But what about like Leviticus 7, 4? I just made that one up right now. It's a real verse. I'm sure of it, but I don't know what one it says, but none of us know. And probably none of us here would be like, that's my favorite. That one's good. We don't even know if it's good. We, we, John three sixteen, love it. Uh, I don't know, like we don't even know, but it's in the same word of God. And many of us would be like, I think the right answer is like, it's all good. But like, do we really live that? Do we agree on that? And th- the thing I'm getting to is like, for many of us, we, we, we want to say what's good, but then we can also look beside us and the next person next to us w- would disagree maybe with some of that definition of what is good they they have a different definition so if we can't even get to the same if you will truth and we know truth cannot be just relative and like whatever you think that's good and whatever you think yep that's good too and they're completely opposite like there is a good if if that can't be found with you or with me then I think what we need to go what does God say is good like what what does he say is good like if we if we just look at some scripture Matthew Jesus explains this, and he explains it in chapter 7, verse 24, and he he says it this way. He says, anyone who listens to my teaching and follows it is wise, like a person who builds a house on solid rock. Though the rain comes and torrents and the floodwaters rise and the winds beat against that house, it won't collapse because it was built on the bedrock. So if Jesus says like, hey, if you, if you listen to my teaching and if you apply it to your life, you will experience what is good because he continues on and he'll explain what's not good. When you build your house on not stable ground and when things come and it will fall apart. And for many of us, we've pursued happiness and just fulfillment in life in all the wrong places on shaky ground and it's fallen every time and we're always left unfulfilled. And maybe if we stop and we say, what does God say is good? How do, how do we live that out? How do we live the spirit out? Like, how, how do we experience that for ourselves? Like, how, do we, how do we stop living a life just always angry and hateful for people and instead live a life of love, of joy, of peace, instead of the chaos that we continue to consume? Patience, instead of a hurried life, missing the things that matter most. How do we continue to go to the things that God says, this is good for you. This is what will value, like you'll find value in. It'll bless you further and further. How do we live this kind of life? You see, uh, I want to go to Matthew 5. It's, it's known as the Beatitudes. I'm going to jump around a little, Sorry. I'm going to read a good amount of verses. If you can get there, good for you. If you can't, it'll, yep, it's already there. Look at them. And Jesus says this, and he says, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Now, that word bless, that word bless in the Greek, it's uh, makarios. Can you say that? Makarios. Good job. What it means is to be fortunate, to be lucky, to be happy, like, the, the, when he says this, he says, man, God will bless. You'll have fortune, if you will. You'll have luck. Not the kind of luck that we're hoping for, roll of the dice, maybe I get some money, that'll be cool. Like, we're, we're talking a different, but man, you will experience blessing. You will be happy. This is what God produces. So when we read this, he says it, God blesses those who are poor. So it's not about your financial wealth and realize your need for him. It's not about anything other than realizing that we need a savior. 
God blesses those who mourn. So even in your darkest moment, you will be comforted by God. God blesses those who are humble, that we don't puff up our chest in pride. For the whole earth will be theirs. God blesses those who hunger and thirst for justice, for they will be satisfied. God blesses those who are merciful, for they will see mercy. God blesses those whose hearts are pure, for they will see God. God blesses those who work for peace, for they will be called children of God. God blesses those who are persecuted for doing right, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. God blesses you. When people mock you, when whatever you face, whatever it might be, because you are my followers. See, when we, when we look at a text like this, it actually lines up so well with Galatians, the fruits of the Spirit, just outlining each of these different things. And for maybe for us, like when we see this, like the constant reminder is, it continues and it says, God blesses those, so this is from God to others, but then it continues to say, like when you receive any redemption. So when it says like, hey, you, you, you've been uh, unjustly persecuted, whatever it is, it's like, and God will get the return. Like it's not about like, so you go and do the justice making. Like you go and make sure an eye for an eye. Like it's not, it's God will bless you and you let God do the work. Like for too many of us, we're, we're like, I gotta get that blessing. I gotta do something to receive the blessing. I gotta, I gotta be a person of patience. I gotta be, what, and it's like, it's not that. Like we, we had this wrong the entire time. It's actually just recognizing the work of God in your life. It's being in that so that the spirit produces Galatians. I'm going back to it. Galatians 5.22. But the Holy Spirit produces. The Holy Spirit produces. And it says in your life. So this is something you will experience. But it's not by your will. It's not by your ability. Like you can't just be more patient on your own accord. Like you can't just say, oh, you just got to put yourself in those environments and build the strength up and all that. Like it's like, no, live in the spirit and let the spirit work in your life. So we, we look at this, this section and we, we discuss happiness and, and all this. And Aristotle, an old philosopher, he said it this way. He says, we are what we repeatedly do. You are what you do, right? Like I mean, we actually more than not believe this because often we go up to someone and go like, what do you do? And then we define them based on what they do. Um, and, and that's already a problem. But we, in some way, there is a reality where you are what you continuously do. So like, what do you do? How, how do you live your life? How, how, how should we live? Like, how do we, uh, how do we live a life of patience when I, I, for one, am very impatient. How do I, how do I overcome this? Because what I don't want is I don't want to just be comfortable with where I'm at. Like, can I, can I be honest for a moment? Like, if we truly trust the word of God, like, if we truly believe this to be his word to us, and when he says the spirit will do this in your life, if we honestly believe that, then we have to come to this, like, conclusion. Like, like God can change things God can work in your life and do more than you could ever imagine. God could take you from the person that you walk with such anger from all the things that have happened in your life. And God could change that completely. Like if we honestly believe this, then I can be a person of patience. When, when I continuously get angry at other people because they aren't moving as fast as I want to move in life. When, when they're not doing what I think we should do faster. When we're not willing to change when, when I want to change. Like if, if that's not the case, then we're going to continue to falter. But if we look at it this way and we say God can change things. He can change this heart. That I can be more peaceful. I can be more kind to the people that I say I love the most. If we honestly believe his word. And we begin to discover it in action in our lives. Like then, then we start to see things. Because so often we've lived this like old school mentality. You've heard the thing, you can't teach an old dog new tricks. 
neuroscience, they discovered that this idea, because they believed it as well, that like as you get older, you no longer can like form new beliefs or change certain habits in your own life or mind. But they've even discovered that this is faltered and false. Like they've discovered that, no, actually, no matter your age, you can still rewire your brain to take on new beliefs. So if, if their science is discovering this, then th- there's no excuse for us to say, no, God says that the Spirit will produce this stuff in my life, and how do I experience that production? And here's what I want you to hear. This is how. Grace is foundational. It's the starting point. Like, this is what you build everything on. Like, uh, neuroscience, they've also just, like, they've termed it, and I think all of us use it in some way, like, you're a type A personality, right? You want to go, you want to take control, you want this, like, I'm a type A personality. Neuroscience, they say, actually, the definition for that is a joyless striving. Like, you're just striving of your own accord, but it never results in what you're hoping. All of us are pursuing happiness, and we're trying to take the reins to get our own happiness, and it never results with the happiness. It's fleeting. And, and good theology, what, what we need when we look at like a text like this, and over the weeks as we unpack each of these fruits of the Spirit, that God says, man, if you live in the, the Spirit will produce this in your life, your life will be forever changed. You'll experience fulfillment and happiness and all this will be lived out. Like if, if we look at this, good theology, what it says is it does not say that we need to uh, produce fruit. To go and like we're all farmers now, so figure it out, guys. Like get the right soil. Like that's not what the text says. Good theology doesn't say that you need to go and accomplish this on your own. What, what it actually says, and Jesus speaks to it in John 15, 4, and he says, remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it's severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. You know what I love about this? Galatians, it's known as the fruits of the Spirit. Here as well, like Jesus uses another illustration or analogy connecting it to the same thing. He's showing us in plain sight that we wouldn't miss this. And he says, hey, you want to experience a fruitful life, fulfillment, happiness? You want this in your life? Here's how you discover, remain in me. Let the Spirit work in you. You don't go produce it on your own. Verse 5, he says, yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. And for too many of us, we've been trying to strive and live out our religion apart from him. We'll use his name. We'll say like, yeah, no, the word of God's great, but we never actually remain in him. So we we go about our lives just always striving and always trying to look good. Some of you have walked around attempting and looking at other people's spirituality and then looking at your own and defining it because of them. So if they read the Bible for 10 minutes a day and you only hit seven, like you all of a sudden question your own spirituality. How wrong? How wrong for us to look at the, how long do I read the Bible or do I pray in my day to discuss? Those are good habits. I'm not saying don't do those. But what I'm saying is, we've too often have made them rules in our life where we have to meet a certain quota or thing to then feel like we're a good Christian. And what Jesus says is, hey, you want to feel like a good Christian? Remain in me. Just remain in me. Let the Spirit work in you. And then you're going to experience love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. We're no longer going to fall by the moments of our day where we act out what we don't want to act out because we continue to go back to the source. Like, if we could set up this conversation, and my hope and my prayer is like, too often... I think for myself, for you probably as well, we can come in, we can have a conversation, it's like 30 minutes, cool, it's getting close, like what are we eating for lunch? Are we going to Rosemary's? Cool, let's go. And, like, and then we're out and we're gone. And we go about our life and then you come and you do it over again. And most people, they don't even come every week, so you're like every 
couple weeks, and then maybe you do it again, and you feel a little better about yourself, and you continue, and you just continue to do that the rest of your life. You're going to continue to get the same thing that you already got. But what I'm saying, what if we just stop for a moment, and if we say, honestly, this is the word of God in our life, and if, if, if we truly believe that it could change our life, that God could heal a marriage, that he could restore a relationship with a kid, that he could uh, build you up in areas that you're so angry at your own self because of how you respond, how you live, how you act, how you talk. And if you just stopped and you said, no, if I trust this and it can change my life and those around me, how do I discover this? Maybe if we first start with just this, and this is my challenge to you this week. I'm not even giving you anything homework to do other than this. Just stop. Like, stop trying. Like, stop, stop basing your spirituality on other people's actions. S stop holding yourself up against the wall saying, as long as I can act the right way. That's what the Pharisees did. That's what Jesus spoke about. That's what Jesus said. You need a savior. You're getting it wrong. You're living by rules, but you're missing the relationship. This is the work of God that has happened in your life. And maybe just this week, it's, I'm gonna stop. And over the next weeks, as we unpack these conversations, these different things that Jesus speaks about, that the Spirit produces in our lives, maybe we can begin to look at them and how do I then realize that in God and then live that out in my life? See, because here's, what if, what if the key to happiness and fulfillment was like a painting on a wall for all to see? And maybe the message was hidden but it was there the entire time. And that God is there speaking to each of us, to every soul on earth, saying, come and see and truly live. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, God. God, I pray that today would just be the beginning of a conversation for each of us. God, that this wouldn't be something that we just take in and never actually look at that we would wrestle with some things. God, how are, how, how are you working in my life? What does it mean for the spirit to truly live in me? And that the spirit of God are these things, then what does that mean for me and how I accept that and then live that out? God, I pray, I pray for us today just that if someone today, they're just walking around with a lot of weight, a lot of weight from their own actions of their past a lot of weight from even the things that they're still told about themselves today people just make these statements because of once were and God just for a moment they begin to see I'm not defined by my past God it's not of my own ability but that I just remain connected to you that I begin to discover power and strength that is found in you God, I pray today, would today be just a moment for each of us just to discover your word in our lives even more, to discover your work, not our own, and that we would truly live. It's in the name of Jesus that we say, amen.